Most scientists and experts agree that nuclear power is safe, cost-effective, and reliable, and that it's likely saved millions of lives. But still, a lot of people hate it. In the United States, nuclear power generates about 20% of our energy and almost half of our clean energy. Yet construction is minimal and the number of plants has actually declined over the past decades as reactor shutdowns now outpace new construction. So what's going on? Hey, I'm Ken LaCourt. I try to tackle controversial issues and I'll do my best to give it to you with as little bias and as much balance as possible. Because worldwide, nuclear energy deserves an unemotional study. We'll go through some of the myths surrounding it, as well as an honest look at the best arguments for and against it. Specifically, we'll look at nuclear energy's scary beginnings, its overall safety records, what to do with nuclear waste, and its potential role in combating global warming. And what we'll see is that much of the debate around nuclear energy boils down to one word, fear. Now, fear isn't bad. Being fearful of lung cancer is a great reason not to smoke. The question is whether that fear is justified. And in the case of nuclear energy, it's, it's kind of hard to argue that it is. New things are scary, especially when they're invisible, and especially when they can kill you. Now, Madame Curie was a physicist who pioneered the study of radioactivity. In fact, she coined that phrase. Her work led to two Nobel Prizes and death by radiation. A decade later, the world's first real experience with nuclear energy was Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where the reality and the images were terrifying. Power plants came online in the 1950s, but to most people, nuclear meant weapons and the peace and environmental movements opposed it all. So did Hollywood. In 1979, a fictional movie, The China Syndrome, scared millions of people with its story of a nuclear power plant melting down. The number of people killed would depend on which way the wind is blowing. Render an area the size of Pennsylvania permanently uninhabitable. Then, 12 days after that movie's release, a nuclear power plant in Pennsylvania, called Three Mile Island, experienced a partial meltdown. To this day, it's the most serious nuclear accident in U.S. history, and it fundamentally changed the country's views on nuclear power. The reactor was badly damaged. It took over a decade to fully fix it. But only a small amount of radioactive material was actually released into the atmosphere. No one was killed, and later studies found no health effects in the surrounding area. But the public was rattled, and they never really recovered. The government radically tightened up control over the industry, and over 100 scheduled reactors were canceled. Construction of new reactors in the country ground to a halt. Who would have thought a nuclear reactor would be so complicated? Seven years later, the Chernobyl accident in Ukraine was much worse. There has been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union, and the Soviets have admitted that it happened. Chernobyl was a uniquely Soviet disaster. The reactors were constructed much differently than most, a design that didn't have proper containment structures. That combined with ignoring safety protocols and some dangerous testing. But even that disaster resulted in the direct deaths of only about 50 people. I'll talk about indirect deaths later. It released a lot of radiation, but most of the people killed were firefighters and cleanup workers, many without even proper equipment like hazmat suits to shield them from the radiation. And to prevent a massive explosion, some of those workers knew they were going on suicide missions. It was pretty incredible. The TV show Chernobyl is pretty accurate and pretty darn scary. It'd be 25 years until the world's next major accident. In 2011, Japan's Fukushima plant was hit by a 9.0 earthquake. That's massive not to mention the 45-foot tsunami that came right after it. It wiped out the area and the plant's backup energy sources, leading to meltdowns in three of its reactors. The Japanese government evacuated the area, although later studies showed that the radiation risk to the public was very low. All three of these events were from reactors that went online in the 70s. They were all scary and spurred substantial safety improvements. But the actual damages from them were much lower than the sensational headlines and movies suggest. But in the end, that didn't really matter. Hey, I'm a pretty good researcher, but I'm not a nuclear scientist. As always, if I make a substantive mistake anywhere in this video, I'll correct it in a pinned comment below. Okay, so the big question, how safe are nuclear reactors? There are a few ways we can look at that. The first is direct deaths or injuries through accidents and operations. On those metrics, nuclear is crazily safe. Now, I mentioned the low numbers of people directly killed in the world's three major accidents, but related death counts are another matter. They're substantially higher, and they're also more controversial and difficult to figure out. For instance, the Japanese government said that while no one died from cancer linked to radiation exposure, 2,200 people died from the evacuation. That included people, mainly older people, who died because of increased stress or interruption to medical care or suicide. 
Now, that's difficult to quantify, but it did spark a big debate on whether the evacuation itself was a good idea. In Chernobyl, the numbers were much likely higher and kind of different. A UN committee said it caused about 4,000 eventual deaths through increased radiation exposure. Environmental groups produced numbers showing it to be much higher, like 15 times higher. It's difficult to know the truth on that. But whatever those real numbers are, they're dwarfed by the deaths caused by fossil fuel production. One Harvard study blamed it for one in five deaths in the world, which is almost nine million people a year. Intuitively, that seems like a high number, maybe driven by activism, but it seems reasonable that carbon pollution throughout history has caused tens of millions of deaths, ignoring deaths from mining, refining, transporting coal, oil, and gas. Those are all dangerous operations. And in routine operations, nuclear reactors are absolutely safe, releasing essentially nothing into the environment. Those familiar towers you see, those just release steam. Interestingly, coal plants actually release radioactive ash into the air and put it into landfills. And this all occurred from naturally occurring elements in the coal itself. But all that said, we have to acknowledge some impossible to quantify dangers of nuclear energy. What are the odds that a terrorist attack could create a major disaster or an unhinged country would secretly turn its energy program into nuclear bombs? The odds are hard to predict, but they're certainly greater than zero, and that's something we all need to keep in mind. But what about the nuclear waste? I've heard about that my whole life. It's a big concern for nuclear energy opponents who correctly point out, for instance, that the United States has produced 90,000 metric tons of nuclear waste in its history, some of which will be dangerous for thousands of years. Now, that sounds like a lot, but nuclear waste is a dense material. The 2,000 tons America generates each year would actually take up less than half of a large swimming pool. In fact, in the 60 years of nuclear energy, all of that waste would fit on a football field about 30 feet high. Compared to toxic ash, sludge, and gases from other power sources, it's a completely different game. Now, nuclear waste isn't a green glowing goo, but a solid material, and the vast majority of it has much lower radiation levels and includes things like tools or equipment that's been exposed. The high-level fuel waste spends five to 10 years cooling down in deep water pools and then it's either recycled to recover usable fuel or sealed in massive steel and concrete dry casks. It lasts a long time, but nuclear waste is a manageable issue, not a boogeyman. And the plants themselves release about as much carbon as solar or wind. Nuclear energy could be a cornerstone of a carbon-free future. But what about those renewables like solar and wind? Can't they power the world on their own? They're absolutely important, but they have some limitations of their own. So the Earth is warming up, and the billions of tons of CO2 we send into the air each year likely has something to do with it. For me, the jury's still out on how bad that might be or how much we can affect it, but a carbon-free energy source makes a whole lot of sense. To radically reduce the world's carbon, the best solutions would be electrify everything, then get electricity from clean sources. Consider this, a single nuclear power plant replacing a coal one is the equivalent of taking about a million cars off the road every year. Now, solar's been growing and is a great technology, but in the US, it still accounts for only about 4% of our energy. Like wind, it takes up a lot of land, it doesn't work in every region, and it doesn't work all the time. Unfortunately, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. The fastest and cheapest way to get to net zero emissions is a combination of nuclear and renewable energy. But how much does it cost? I dug into the construction and energy generation costs of them all, and they're confusing as heck. And a lot of sources try to spin the numbers to support their cause. There are a huge number of factors, from regulations to amount of land needed to hooking up rural energy production into the nation's power grid. But all in all, it seems fair to say that while solar appears cheaper at first glance, nuclear's high capacity factor, it, it, it operates all the time, and its long lifespan make it competitive over time. And advanced reactor designs like modular reactors could make nuclear even more affordable and easier to use. Experts say they're safer and more flexible than traditional reactors. But building a new reactor is amazingly expensive and doesn't take just a few years. It takes at least a decade. Now, part of that is new designs that create construction issues, but it's mostly because of massive government regulations, which are understandable to a certain extent. Heck, in my small town, it recently took them three years to renovate a small park. Imagine how a government would deal with a nuclear reactor that everyone's afraid of. All that said, it's good to note that nuclear isn't the ultimate forever solution. Fusion may work, or Brainiac may figure out how to massively increase the efficiency of solar and it's game over. But a government serious about reducing CO2 needs to look unemotionally at nuclear energy. France leads the world getting over 70% of its electricity from nuclear. 
and its CO2 emissions are about one-sixth of the European average and at competitive prices. It's something to think about. But I want to end by talking about the really scary energy from nuclear, bombs. Earlier I mentioned Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And as I looked at history, I never fully understood why the United States dropped the second nuclear bomb on Japan only three days after the first. I did a little bit of research and then some more before knowing I had to do a video on it because what they teach kids in school just isn't supported by historical records. There are some amazing stories behind that decision. Hey, as always, I hope I shared some solid information and made you think a little harder and maybe get a little smarter. I know I did. Come back again.